and we're ready to roll. Okay, welcome everybody. I, I do apologise that I'm about 15 minutes late or thereabouts, so I'm um, uh, um, Thank you all for um, coming along to the uh, Australian Numismatic Society's um, November meeting. It's um, meeting number uh, 1,194. 1,194, yes. Um, welcome to our visitor at the moment, Ernie. Um, please make him welcome whenever you um, at, after the meeting and that, uh, sort of just let him know that um, we're a nice bunch of blokes. <laughs> I can see that already. Thank you. Yeah, I can see that. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, okay, look, um, we have apologies. Uh, yeah, apologies from Matthew Lloyd, uh, Robert Tonner, Les Carlisle, um, Frank Shelley, Murray Bragg, Peter Dunstan, Lindy Hall, Barry Towers. Any other people that have um, sent their apologies? Did anyone know that? No? Okay. Um, look, um, as a, well, most people know that um, you know, the, this um, past three or four months have been a horrible past three, three or four months. Um, but one of our other members, uh, Peter Dunstan's wife, passed away a couple of weeks, uh, a week or so ago last, uh, the other day too. What's going on? Yeah. I don't know, but you know, put it this way, if you guys had wives, tell them to look out. <laughs> yeah. Because it seems, look you know, after, look your after. husband's with the ANS, it doesn't look good. Yeah. Um, big insurance policy on Yeah. yeah. Um, the um, funeral service for Lisa Dunstan is on tomorrow at one o'clock. At the North Wright Memorial, uh, what is it, Macquarie? Macquarie. Um, Memorial Park, for anyone that wants to know. Um, and again, I, 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 you know, last month we had a moment of silence, a minute of silence for Rod's wife and my wife, so I think it's only fitting that we gave a minute of silence for Peter Dunson's wife. Um, so if we all stand up, please, and um, so, um, the name of Lisa. John. Jane. Jane. Okay, so. to um, general business. Now we have um, <coughs> our next meeting uh, Monday, 10th of December. I will be back at Phyllis House at, at 8 o'clock. Now, um, it, as Rod said, if the gate in the front is, is locked, um, please ring the bell and um, somebody will come down from the first floor and open up the gate. Um, it has a habit of locking because of other tenants. They, As they leave for the night, they lock the gate and then we can't get in. So, but there is a bell, um, just push the bell and, and uh, somebody will come down to open up the gate. Um, it's our display competition, the Christmas social. So please um, bring along some um, something to display and, um, and talk about it and we'll vote on it at the um, end of the night um, while we have our Christmas social and um, yeah. It, uh, so I said bring a plate and make sure there's food in it. Yeah, bring a display and a plate of food. But um, yeah, but the display should really be numismatic related, not um, not the food. Okay. So. Denture plate won't do. No, no, no denture plates. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there any other general business that uh, that we uh, might uh, need to just quickly discuss? There was just one thing I just sort of mentioned to all of you. I, I did speak to. To Les before I came on to check with him got a and he wasn't going. And I asked him how he was. Well, <coughs> his, his back has been giving him a little bit of trouble. He's just had injections again today or, or yesterday, probably. And, uh, you know, he's, he's in a little bit of pain. But when he has 
when he has the injection, it's all right. And then it sort of gradually gets worse and worse. And so he's had about four now so far. And I think the doctor's going to have another tack and see whether there's some other way of sort of checking it. And, and Margaret's still the same, so she's yeah. still okay. so I just have to spare there. Okay, thank you, Tony. All right, well, um, if there's no other business, um, we'll invite Jim Noble to um, tell us about the, the market and um, his up, uh, upcoming auction, uh, forthcoming auction. Thank you. Thank you, John. And um, uh, take it away. We've got a catalogue out. If anybody would like one, I've got copies here. And um, I sent them in the mail mostly to, but they only went last Monday and they went normal post, except the ones which I took down to the mail exchange because Australia Post wouldn't pick them up on the Friday. So I took the overseas ones down to the mail exchange and they got them the following Monday from Friday in New Zealand and they got them Tuesday in uh, England and Japan and America. So the Express Post Service pays. You have to spend a lot but it gets the catalogue to people in time. Um, so uh, a couple of interstate people have got theirs last Thursday having been picked up here last Monday. But some of you locals still haven't got it yet. Uh, Bill Myra's widow, Finn, she got hers the next day on the Tuesday, so I don't know. Just depends, depends on, on how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a very big catalogue again. There's 5,075 lots, 17 sessions it's packed into, which is uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, day and night, and then Friday, two sessions, finishing just after lunch on the Friday. Um, so you can pick up that day and, and take your goods and whatever you... But the, the viewing is virtually ready to start now. It starts on Wednesday, but we're, we're all set up. We've found all but two lots, which must have been misnumbered or something, so we're all organised there. And um, so I'll, without any further ado, because we're running late, I'll go through these coins pretty quickly. I've picked out quite a few. Um, we have the usual format as we had in the last so where we start with miscellaneous Australian coins and then go into error coins, misstruck coins. So here's a a 1926 shilling which is struck <coughs> off centre and out of the collar so it's got a plain edge and it's unusual to get a George V silver coin uh, misstruck these days. It came from a collection at the last minute that came into the sale. It's just, it's just to show you, you know, a, an example of a coin struck off centre. They would have been very careful in those days and made sure they didn't get out. Yeah, this production would have been a bit slower. But it's quite enough. You don't have to show the other side if you don't want to. Uh, the next. Because I think misstrikes and error coins are always very interesting, aren't they? There seems to be a good current fad that people are like collecting them. What's the history on that thing? Oh, gee. I'm going to refer to the catalogue, haven't I? It would be, um, it would probably go for a penny back because it's not a lot of money. $350. Oh, it's too bad for the board now. Well, there you go. See, they've already got a bid. <laughs> <laughs> now, the next one is an exciting one. It's the first one we've had for a penny, a full obverse brockage. Okay, that's the obverse. Very sharply struck, this coin. And I think it must have been really pressed hard against the uh, coin that was already in the press because the rim is very high, very high raised rim and it's a perfect block. Oh, wow. So, you know, for George V that's really incredible. Mm -hmm. Find a full blockage. Yeah. So the estimate on that's 5,000. Really nice. It's the first it? one we've ever had. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. I thought it was struck like a proof. But it may, it may be that they struck it twice, but there's no movement or anything. No, it's really good. And you haven't handled that one before? No. This is a, 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 mis, a, a George V, uh, I've had a brockage hate me, but not a penny. This is a nice condition, 1948 Thropets Mistruck, just the original mint flow. I thought that would appeal to people. I think that's uh, number... Uh, 99. 99, that's estimated. It. $250. Now, we try to give you a reasonable guide to the value of these things. If you can pick that up for $200, $250, it's probably a nice thing to own. Uh, 
Uh, this time we don't have decimal ones so much as we have pre-decimal. That's a nice full brockage. Lot 105 of the thruppence. 55. 955 thruppence and that's estimated at $500. Which the thruppences are usually the, the cheapest ones to buy in brockages. It's not quite complete because it's um, the coin that it struck against is not quite centred. They from different vendors? Yeah, the um, the, the um, yeah, different vendors, all right. This one came in from a chap who had his coin stolen, his safe stolen, and he came in, he desperate to give me his collection, and his banknotes, and I thought, I'll list you some of your, even though your, the auction's closed, I'll list some of your missed strikes, and then I noticed he had error notes, so I listed some of those. So he'll be pleased. I put more in than he expected. Um, this is just a sample of one of the misstruck lots, so lot 109. It's a... Uh, Look at the pe yeah, that's from uh, Gordon Shortland's collection, and uh, his stuff's here with us. We, we were sorting through. We found a number of uh, off-center strikes with his collection. That's estimated at three hundred dollars for the three coins. They're in quite nice condition. There's a high rim on the floor, uh, high lip. Uh, All nineteen sixty. Yeah, so Gordon was an active collector at that time. So he's Probably gone through a lot of coins to find those and put them aside. Yeah. Remember, he used to chain smoke cigars. Good for a doctor, eh? GP. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, uh, the 1976 10 cent piece, full brockage from that collection I was just mentioning before. Sorry. That one was 109. I yeah. forgot to write the number down. Sorry. You've got a lot of work to do there, haven't you? Um, yeah, that's a nice full obverse brockage. I think I put 900 on that. 1,000. Have I? 1,000. Gee. Maybe it's a bargain at 900. Okay, the 1,000. <laughs> I mean, the numismatic marketplace, as far as I'm concerned, is pretty dead across the counter here and every dealer says the same but auctions are always good I think everyone's focused on the internet and everything like that now and <laughs> shop buying is very scarce, very rare and uh, we're the only one in town practically there's Roberts at, uh, Wind uh, over at uh, Barrack Street and the Town Hall coins the only other two coin shops in the city People don't know about us yet, after 40 years and 45 years, you're still trying to find out about us. I've got it street level. I get a lot of passing people who pass by and they get to know us. But we've still got people calling us saying someone came in today didn't know we, were, we existed. So What's there's always hope. If you get a terror attack out the front, you'll get some notes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's an interesting mystery. I said to this guy, What's happened here? He said, oh, I don't know, but he said, I found that in a box of 50 cents and I want a thousand, but I won't sell it for less. I said, well, I'm not going to argue with you. It's intriguing. It looks like it was struck up against a, another uh, coin that was a brockage and it broke uh, a smaller denomination. And because that smaller, where it says Elizabeth backwards, that's in relief. Mm. So it's very interesting. Yeah. Explaining that one. <laughs> it's one for Paul Holland, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Try and explain that. So it's a thousand on that one. Now then we go into historical medals in the fourth session. I mean, there are a lot of other lots, but this is a, another interesting engraved convict token. You mightn't be able to see it very, very well, but it's estimated at three and a half thousand. I've already had a bid on it at that level. Um, Lot number, what's the lot number? Nine, nine five. five nine. Yeah, I can read the description better. I was trying to see it. Okay, nine five nine is a convict love token on a cartwheel penny, seventeen ninety seven. Isaac Huxtable and Fanny Carr, two names on it, and. He was convicted in Bristol Quarter Session, 1832, to seven years transportation and sale via Rio de Janeiro and arrived at 
Fort Jackson, Sydney in 1833. So it's an interesting convict token. These fascinate museum curators and historians, as well as numismatists, obviously. They're contemporary records of convicts, and their history can be researched. So that one, uh, it has a diagram on it of a couple holding hands, does it? Interesting. Yeah, it's very hard, it's to, hard see. to see. You yeah. can see it in the catalogue. Don't, don't spend too much time on it, but this this one here, the next one, it's just got a legend on both sides, uh, and it's for presented to Mary Ann Groves, uh, who was convicted in Scotland at Glasgow Court to 10 years transportation. Uh, she went to Tasmania in 1848, and uh, in 1953 she was given a ticket to leave. That's estimated at 1,500. Um, I've got a number of collectors mentioned. Gordon Shortland was written up in our last catalogue, sale 118. I've written up a few in the front of this one. Uh, and I wrote, wrote up this collector's given his apologies tonight, Dr Barry Towers. Right. And, and, and this is a medal he bought in one of the earlier sales, which is uh, struck in sterling silver, uh, the Bert Hinkler medal. Quite a rare piece in that metal, and uh, you can probably buy it for less now than Barry paid for it. He probably missed them at a 1500. What, what lot number? A uh, lot number 994. 994. Only three sterling silver medals were struck, so it was out of our sale 105. I said to Barry, You're still collecting? Yeah, he said, Yeah, but I'm sort of, but he said, I've had to get, get rid of this stuff. But, um, I said, you used to go to Carring Bar uh, to practice and you lived in Rose Bay. He said, yeah. He said, well, he said, that's when I met Tom Hamley. He came in as one of my patients. Unfortunately, there's a mistype in the, in the catalogue. They put the wrong name, Tom Hardy. They put, well, of course, it's Hamley. Um, our illustrious secretary and former president. Uh, so, lot 1204. Proof Halfpenny. Ah, okay. Proof Halfpenny, yeah. I've skipped a couple of gold coins I've got in the expensive box. I'll get them out. I know you'd like to see a couple of the expensive ones. That Proof Halfpenny was bought by a guy who bought it from Greg McDonald. You see he paid 21000 for it. But it's in, in this sale at... Uh, 1204, it's 9,000. 9,000. A couple of people interested in really I couldn't track the pedigree, but it must have got it one of our sales. This Adelaide Pound's been in the Victorian family's possession since the 19th century. And uh, it's a really nice cracked Adelaide Pound. That's the dearest coin in the auction, it's estimated at 50,000. I used to get 100,000 for those, so you ask yourself, where's the numismatic marketplace? I had one customer come and he said, oh, that won't go for 50, that would go for 130. He said, oh, that's, I said, is that the coin you like? He said, yeah. I said, well, maybe he'll go for it, I don't know. But yeah, I used to sell them for 100,000. So maybe it's a good time to buy it. <laughs> you know, if, if, if the top bid's 50,000, it's yours. Ross is thinking about yeah, it. Definitely. <laughs> I'm just going to sort of thank you. <laughs> well, they're no good, do you? They're not helping us any more bank managers. So this is just another Adelaide pound. I just uh, just an Adelaide pound. <laughs> type two. I've been trying to sell this one. It belongs to the Bob Dean estate collection, and it was started out life at about twenty-five thousand. I think it's down to uh, fifteen thousand there. Eighteen thousand. No, sorry. One one two six. Yeah, no one one. Yeah, that's down to uh, 14,000 now. There's another one, the one before it, which I meant to show you is... Um, <coughs> yeah, it's, don't, don't spend too much time on that. This is, 
This is a better struck one. It doesn't have the adjustment mark, the weak rim that that one had. Well, this one's estimated at 18,000, and John Cox bought this, I think, for 30 odd thousand years ago for his super uh, through Greg McDonald's. Greg's riding there. He just told me I put the coins in, and I said, "Okay, I've been hanging on to them for a while for him." He's just bitten the bullet. So you, these are the advantages you got. You can sit back now, you old members, and now you can spend your money and buy coins cheaply. Thanks. Well, you know, we're only custodians of this. Remember, it'll come back to me to sell one day. <laughs> Ross can buy them cheaply. Just interested. Oh, yeah. This we've got a, a, a 1922 Sydney Sovereign. Do you want to look at that? He bought the, the man bought this for forty one thousand. Now it's in at twenty thousand. So the numismatic marketplace varies, supply and demand. We've got so many coins to get through, I'm worried about our timing will be here for two hours at this pace. I might speed it up, skip a few coins or whatever. Yeah. When it's time for tea, you just say, that's it, folks. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a spectacular square penny chap brought me at the last minute. I said, it's truth, it's like a beautiful proof. It's magnificent. 1919 square penny type six. I just couldn't believe the condition it was in. I was thinking, I haven't seen that one before. And then I thought, it's not one of the silver ones, is it? But it's cupro nickel, but I can't weigh it really. I tried to give an idea of its weight by weighing the plastic. It's slammed. And they've called it MS. But when you look at it, it's just brilliant. And and, and they, they, they did they did strike that one in silver. Here's a nineteen twenty one McKennell, the normal one you see. That first square penny I showed you, I think the man paid quite a lot of money for it. It's an estimated 35, but he, he paid, I think he paid six figures for it. This one, I remember one selling Tom Hanley's one of these for 90,000. It's got 25,000 there. That was 10 years ago. <laughs> Good time to sell. <laughs> There's a very nice 39 Rue Hapney there. Very nice. Proof Hapney. Then they introduced that design for the Hapney. They already had it on the penny, but it took them a year longer to switch to that mm. design for the Hapney. The kangaroo. Wherever we can, we include the original dealer's ticket or collector's ticket with the coins. That one's from Greg McDonald. Um, just gotta get myself organised here. So, did I get all the Adelaide pounds back from Mr. Brown? Mm. Two, the only going to five. Oh, missing one. It's a type one that I didn't see. Oh, you didn't see the type one. I snuck it away on you, did I? Oh, I did too. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, now we've got a 1910 Florin, which is what, 1263. I just thought I'd show you a few Florins. You know, you think, how do I get a good collection of Australian Commonwealth three times a year? And then a guy walked in a whole customer of mine and he said, I want to sell them a good two bobs. I thought, oh, beauty. But that's all I've got was good two bobs. I've got some good pennies. Um, select some other things. But it was nice to get some. Good florins. So I'm showing a couple of them tonight. I think that one's estimated at 1500, that 1910, our first florin. Yeah, because every member of the Numismatic Society would have one in their collection. Of course. With their salt. But not that tradition. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only, only difference. 14H. That's a 14H in nice grade. 
I think I've got two and a half thousand on that. The difference between perfect mint state and good EF or nearly uncircular is a big difference in price. The next one's a frosty uncirculated 1921 florin, <coughs> which came out of the um, 1921 hoard. It was on the front cover of our catalogue, that one. So anyway, now I've got a collector who's looked at it online and he likes it, he wants me to buy it for him. Uh, he, uh, he's an Aussie guy, but he lives overseas. And uh, yeah, he's, he said he'd like that one. I mean, the key date, of course, is 1932, and this is an exceptional 1932 we're about to look at. Nice natural mint bloom there. Beautiful. So, you know, that's 12,500. That's top grade 1932. There's another one in the sale, not quite as nice as 4,000. So you can see the difference in price. It's a 1928 shilling, lot 1311. That's a key date to get in high grade, 1928 <laughs> shilling. Well, that's a nice one, I think we've got a thousand like. There's a uh, a coin that came in the last minute was this, with a couple of other pennies, which I'll show you too now. Uh, this lot 1335, a 1915 London mint penny in brand new condition, like it's untouched. It's a, okay, there's a little bit of toning, but it's absolutely nearly full mint red. I, I've called it red and brown on Circo, but it's really, really good for that day. And the guy who gave it to me said his father had it. And I've known the guy for a long time, but you know, I didn't know he had any coins. And uh, I was just stunned. I said, I've got to get this in the sale. Came in when we were all closed, of course. Red Bob's whinging. And he's going, oh, I'm not doing any more photos. I said, up's not there. <laughs> I said, you've got to get these in. And this 1917 penny is just full red on the reverse. Brilliant. Struck in Calcutta. We had to strike coins in Calcutta because of the war. You couldn't get dyes through to the Melbourne Mint time, uh, the shipping, so they produced a lot of coins in India, 1916, 17 and 18. It's a, although it's not the rare, rare estate, it's probably the common estate, that in the 16. It's just lovely condition. Yeah, what have we got here? 19, probably a 1930 penny, because I know you all want one of 1930 penny. The chap came in, he got a few 1930 pennies, he let me have this one, he showed me about four of them. And of the four he, I, I, I valued for him, he gave me the lowest price one. I thought, he's pretty mean. He said, I'm going to New Zealand for a couple of weeks, I'll, I'll come back and see you, but he never did. But I know him, he's bought from us before. So that's estimated, I think, 18 no, uh, 18,000, yeah, I think. What, what steps have you taken to identify a fake 1930 penny? Oh, I look at, I look at, I've looked at a lot of them and I've got a photo here where I work out. I know the dye states and uh, you've got to have an Indian dye usually. But there is an English, a London dye known, a couple of them. But you've got to know what you're looking at. You've got to be care very careful. There's a lot of... Uh, modern forgeries, which are easy to tell, uh, but there are altered coins which have been very carefully done by jewellers, and there are pretty obvious ones that people used to ah, I found a 1930, pretend they found it in a pub and rip someone off in the <laughs> dark. <laughs> Goes back a long time faking 1930 pennies, but if you know the dies and you study the literature, you can tell. What was that? What, that was 1360, was it? Uh, 1363. Um, 
So 1930 pennies have still stayed pretty much stable. They haven't fallen in price. And they seem to sell at auction, even if I've got four or five. I've only got two this time. So what are they, about 10,000 still? No, they're about fifteen to 18,000. Okay. You've been asleep for a while, I can tell. Well, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't tried to buy one. Well, all the serious pure and you miss would have said, why would you worry about a year, different year date? But, you know, collecting's about collecting rarity and the rarest thing, the king of Australian coins, you know, not a pretty penny. The next one I'm going to show you is from the same Indian obverse die, but it's a 1931 drop one, and it's rarer than a 1930 penny. Lot 1360s. And this comes from uh, the Dr. Phil Bird collection, which was flown down to me from Queensland. And he had so many pennies, I tell you, that's why we've got bulk lots out there, uh, under cover there. There are bulk lots in the auction if you want to try and lift them. I dare you. Uh, and we've got a lot of penny varieties, but in his main penny album, he had this 1931 um, drop one Indian die, which I put 3,000 on. And he had a second one, which I put 1,500 on. When you say the drop one? The drop one, the one's out of alignment. See how it's <coughs> lower down? The, the last one? Yeah, the last one. And the, they were striking these um, with the die that they struck the 1930 penny, so uh, they're very close to get them striking. But there are, I think, uh, Paul Holland's only ever found a few of these. Uh, there's very few known. What what happened when they found it out? They sort of stopped striking them, or what? No, I think it's just that it, the, 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 they got a, a, another die, the London die, in production then. So you, they, they probably struck a number of coins with one master die, then the other one was ready, which was fresher, and they used it. So you, that's why you get a little bit of variation in the die use in the Australian Penny series. There's a very good article in the latest NAA journal by Paul Holland about pennies. Uh, this is a famous coin because it's got a great name. It's called Renovo, is it? <laughs> so no one's allowed to bid against me on this. I'd have thought you just thought of the market. Got a noble. I've had them, but I thought this is my chance to get a noble again. It's from William Rado's collection. He used to be, he died age 90, but he used to be living in London and he bought quite a few good gold coins. And he used to come to our auctions back in the 70s. But he also came in to our auctions very near his death with his daughter. And this, uh, I've forgotten he had this noble, the Henry VI noble. It's pretty well struck, it's got the right weight, and it's only $3,000. But you are allowed to bid against me. It would be unfair for me to try and steal that one. <laughs> Even though it's got my name on it. <laughs> now I will. <laughs> this is a Charles II, two guineas, 1679. Again from Rado's collection, he had quite a lot of gold coins. The decision was made, I got them at the last minute. We were already closed, but I spent the weekend cataloguing them, 200 lots, and photo Bob had to photograph them. So since Bob came back from his overseas trip, he's just been working all the time. Photographing, photographing. 1679. So that's a $3,000 coin. I've had a bid from London of that figure, so it makes me happy, I think. Sorry, what was the number? Uh, 16... 17... No, 1760. But it's 1679. The nice one that's on the front cover is a William III guinea. Um, lot number 1762. It's got a lot of mint lustre on the reverse. The obverses are all a bit flat with that portrait. But a lot of mint blue on the reverse. Very good condition for a guinea. I think I've got that estimated at 6,000. <coughs> <coughs> I've got a bit already of five on it. Nice two guineas of George II with the young head. 1767 is the number. Again from Rado's collection. 
we put the uh, yeah, lucky you had all these two, last minute entries Jim three, yeah. three thousand yeah I know oh, that's what I live for you never know what's going to happen the next day yeah. coming to work is a joy even though I'll do it seven days a week when I'm not worn out Two hundred and fifty vendors were selling for in this sale. Um, I've got to go quicker because it's half past eight. We'll be here forever. Um, and we do want tea. Another George the second, two guineas. This time it's the intermediate or older head, and it's uh, two and a half thousand. Because Rado lived in London, he was able to get good examples of these sort of coins. He, he, I remember he had a lot of these coins when he could in the, in the nursing home. I was ter terribly worried about the security for them. Luckily, I, his daughter managed to get some back. We, we sold a couple of coins for him in the past. We sold one Russian coin for 58000 on a 7000 estimate. A gold coin that belonged to uh, a couple of famous collectors. It was sold at Christie's in 1951. So this fourth bust, George III Guinea, is in nice condition. A lot of mint bloom, a lot of uh, proof white mint bloom. Same as the next one, which is the Spade Guineas. You know why it was called the Spade Guinea? Because the shield on the reverse is shaped like a spade. Uh, this is the 1788 version, which is, of course, the famous year for Australia, the year of the first fleet. Mm. Might have come out on one of the ships. <laughs> That's, it's just a really nice example. When you're trying to look at these through this plastic, you get a lot of the markings showing up in the lighting uh, and a lot of the marking on the plastic. So you've got to allow for that. You get reflection to your face. Yeah. No. It's not ideal. Now, this is uh, an interesting sovereign, this one coming up now, Queen Victoria Shield Sovereign. It's dated 1863, so I was about to grade it. I was looking at it. And I was, and then I looked at the truncation on the Queen's neck. It's got a number, not WW, it's got 827, which is a special die number. Well, actually, they say it's an ingot number. Not a die number, because die numbers were put on the reverse. This is one of about six known. And the last one offered was offered at £12,000. And this is a normal bullion sovereign. I'm thinking, I can't estimate it at $400. So I put 5000 on it. So there is a bargain. He didn't know he had it. We've discovered that coin. Just in catalogs. It's one of the super rarities of the world sovereign series. First one ever seen in Australia, I'll bet you. Okay, so that, one of the interesting things that happened for this auction was when Heather Rich asked me to go and pick up some books from Matthew's collection, she said, I found some coin trays. And then look at these coin trays, it's got coins in them. I was going to pick up books, I ended up picking up these British historical medals and these Anglo-Saxon coins, and hammered, English hammered silver coins. Which oh, was a great, number. it was great because he, he oh this was lot 1853, he, um, he had sold his collection of Roman, he'd sold his collection of ancient British, we had some of his historical medals of a larger size, but these ones of Cromwell and Charles I period, we, uh, we got here, <coughs> they <coughs> coming up on the second day in the um, uh, seventh session, and then the eighth session starts the actual Anglo-Saxon coins. So the seventh session's at 11.30. Good time, I want people to be awake bidding on these medals. That's one for the uh, um, Scottish uh, coronation of Charles I in 1633. But this one I like, this one showing the king riding his horse, 18, what, 1854, over uh, the city of London. You like that one? Yeah. Mm. 16. 
1634. 44, is it? No, 1633. 33. Yeah. Return to London. Return to London, yeah. So that's a nice medal. They estimated at $350 because we think it's the cast version, which is slightly lighter in weight. It was originally a die uh, by Nicholas Brio. It weighs 15.22 grams. Some of these are things that we don't often see. This one here is Peace or War, 1643. Charles I, estimate $300. Some of these were bought from Spinks in London through the Numismatic Circular. They changed in price, or are they, what were they in 93? Oh, they're probably dearer than that. I've got low estimates on these because I, you know, I find you people very tight. Mm -hmm. and you, you won't spend it unless I entice you. You know, when you're getting Will things you can only... Oh, no, not if you're bidding. Why wouldn't you buy them? What an opportunity. This one's interesting, the constancy of the king. I was trying to work out what this medal was about. When I saw the, the axe going down on the anvil, it was actually a hammer, hammering a diamond on an anvil of the reverse, Charles I. So it's telling you that the king's unconquerable because diamonds are the hardest thing and it's a hammer, hammering a diamond. Interesting story, isn't it? That's a lot. 1859 estimated $200. Silver medal uh, by Thomas Rawls, 1649. Also, the year he was executed, his head was chopped off, as you know. The next medal that I picked out, 1861, was one of Charles and Henrietta Maria, an Oval Royalist badge by Thomas Rawls. But what's nice about this one, estimated at 700, is it originally was in the John Glude Murdoch collection, 1903 4 in London. So, very good pedigree, one of the greatest collections of all time of English coins and medals. He was a piano manufacturer and <coughs> a substantially wealthy Scottish gentleman. The mints, the mints liked him so much they made proof of stone gold coins for him. He bought a lot of Montague's coins, who was uh, the other great collector. He collected the greatest collection of all time, direct, practically, in, in the space of about 20 years. So I, I should have been born then, though. More appreciative collectors around. <laughs> this, this Royalist badge is in at only $150. I let Richard catalogue these things. And I helped him with the prices. I thought this is pretty cheap, $150 for a Charles I Royalist badge that had been gilt. It's lost most of its gilding. But, uh, you know, a contemporary piece of Charles I. Um, $150. Why wouldn't you bid on it? These medals are probably the best selection of this period that we've had. We did have a lot of good ones from Tom May a few years ago. Lot 1863 is a Charles I silver piece that's uh, undated, it's cast and chased, but it's reckoned that it could have been a pattern for a half crown. That's how it's always been catalogued. It's listed in medallic illustrations. Quite interesting design. Of course, Charles I was defeated by Cromwell. Cromwell ruled from 1649 to 1658. And in 1650, he had a military reward called the Dunbar Medal. Shows the Houses of Parliament there, the Long Parliament. So it's a very fascinating medal by uh, Thomas Simon, the famous engraver who engraved the petition crown and Cromwell's coins. Uh, interesting 
wording on it, the way it's placed. The Lord of hosts. Year 3, 1650. That's the third year of his reign, I'd say. That's uh, about 1866 and it's estimated $500. I know Mark Friel is incidentally back home, folks. He's been in hospital for five weeks. He always liked these. He liked one of these. He's got the catalogue, so I need to talk to him about this sale if he wants to come in and view. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is uh, lot 1870 is a Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell. He, he bought this one from Antiquarius Robert Luston in May 1992. It's estimated $450. It's a nice piece. It's a wonder the nose hasn't been flattened over the years. Yeah. Because that's, that's the high point that would go first. It's, a, it's called a Geneva copy. So someone in Switzerland made it from the original uh, design by Thomas Simon. That's why it's only four to fifty dollars. <coughs> Sixteen fifty-three is the date. So there are quite a few medals, and they go into a later period. One of our members has given me a few who has, doesn't often come to the meetings, but he's been collecting historical medals for years. And we go into the next session. The 2.30 session on the Wednesday and we've got a number of small early Anglo-Saxon skeets which I didn't show you any and then we go into Penny's This Is Lot 1942 The King of Mercy, a burger uh, 8, 852 to 874 and this one's estimated at $700 it's in nice condition and all the Anglo-Saxon pennies are in pretty good condition and reasonably priced. He didn't lash out and buy rarities, although he did buy Harold II, which I've got here to show you, uh, for 6,000 years ago. And that's always a popular coin to get. You know, Harold was uh, killed with an arrow in the forehead in 1066 and all that. The Battle of Hastings. This next one is lot 1943, and that is a coin of a Viking occupation of York. It's estimated six hundred dollars. A typical example. We won't spend time on these because uh, trying to get through it. Now this next coin is interesting. Lot 1944. It's a coin that was produced for a man called Ethelwolf. And he had a son, Ethelbald. But because no coins of this king of Essex, Wessex, Ethelbald, exist, a man called John White used to go to the auctions at Sotheby's in the 1750s and buy coins, and then he very skillfully altered them. And this is a beautiful example of one. Ethelbald. Rex, you see, you can just see where the legend says the uh, Ethel is all right, that's normal, and the B-A-L-D has been altered from Ethel Wolf. So he's been able to manage to create that. Now you wouldn't know normally, you'd say, ah, oh, I found the coin of Ethelbald, but... That E in Ethel looks like it's been tampered with too. Yeah. This has been uh, in the collection of a man called Walter James Lawson, who's still alive, living in Brisbane, and his uh, collection, main collections, were sold through us in 1989 in sales 28 and sale 30. I didn't think he was still alive, and then I got contact with him. Oh, great! You know, he's got great coins, but unfortunately, they'd all gone, and we just you know, a number of Roman coins. But this very interesting coin, I said, well, you know, when I looked at it, I didn't want to say it was a fake. I had to do my research on it. So, Jim, does, does that make it? Does that detract from the coin, or anything? well, it's an Ethelwolf penny, but it's been all that did do Ethelbald. It's Estimated five hundred dollars, and you can't buy an ethel wolf for five hundred, and you can't buy an ethel bull at all, and it's uh, two hundred and something years old, three hundred years old. What am I saying? Nearly incredible. Hmm. Seventeen fifty, I it was made. 
original. Oh, yeah, the original. Yeah, but the creation of Ethel Ball as a, as a coin. Very interesting. There's a... This one is lot number 1948. That's a Idrid penny. Small cross penny. Oswald's the money. And that comes from Lord Stewartby's collection. How about that? The academic collector. He was uh, high up in the British government. Wrote the coins of Scotland when he was 18. Had a pretty good mind. Passed, I met him, he passed away only in recent times. Best collection of Scottish coins ever formed. Part of it was stolen, never recovered. Tragedy. Things happen. You've got to be careful with your coins. Loose slips sink ships. That's why you're lucky you're in this secret place tonight. No one can see you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but it's, it takes him. I can talk fast, but it takes him time to show you the coin. Tell me if you want me to stop. Maybe I won't show... Well, I will show you the Harold the Second Penny. But Rodney loves this. You've got to understand that, really. <laughs> Rudy wants to see the French medals. I didn't put them out. Oh. He'll have to come and view. Yeah. <laughs> We're open for business tomorrow. This next one is the Harold's Second Penny. And what's interesting about this is it's from Wilton Mint, which is a rare mint. Very rare coin. And um, he bought it from a CNG fixed price list. So it wouldn't have been that cheap. But I think he paid over 6000 And he was estimated at five. Yeah. PAX for peace. He was trying to have peace, but William McConkery had other ideas, didn't he? Right. Those Frenchmen coming across, those Normans, upset us English. <laughs> yeah, but Harold had just fought the <laughs> Fort Harold had rather he defeated him up north. Speaking of William the Conqueror, there's one I thought I'd better show you. William the Conqueror. Pax Penny as well. The last title of William the Conqueror. 1086 to 1087, that was issued 20 years after. The Battle of Hastings. So it's a coin from the South which is, you know, London really, southern London. Okay, he, Matthew had some uh, middle period stuff. He had some, quite a few uh, Plantagenet coins. He has uh, groats of Edward and III and Henry the Sixth, and but this is a Mary <coughs> Mary Great portrait in the Renaissance time. Uh, quite a nice portrait, I thought. Nice condition, isn't it? Estimated at $700. I've got these coins out of order, but what I want to show you, which is interesting, is a coin I was debating to, whether I put it in the mistruck coins or put it in the British. But it's, it's, it's a grote of, lot 2026, a grote of Henry the eighth, a posthumous issue from the Bristol Mint. But what's interesting is there were two people in charge of Bristol consecutively, uh, one after the other, and this is two reverse dies struck. One for William Sharrington, the other for um, uh, TC Thomas Chamberlain. There's quite a bit of interesting footnote history in this description of this lot and we've enlarged it. It's completely unknown. It's never been recorded and there's been a good study of these coins done in the British Numismatic Society. So this should open eyes with people around the world. Uh, it's estimated at 500 and a, a very generous dealer from London's bid 650 and if he gets it for 650 I'll kill him. You can bid 700 Jim. <laughs> <laughs> now this is one that uh, Walter Lawson told me it has been authenticated in Brisbane, but it's an Oxford crown by Rawlins, a $100,000 coin, but you can get it for 500 because we think it's a beautiful cast. Well, what's fascinating about it is the actual planchet is cracked, and the crack, internal crack goes right through to the centre of the coin almost. It's actually cracked the flame, and it has been authenticated, so maybe I've made a mistake. It weighs 29 
uh, grams, so the weight's pretty right. And it's, but you know, it's maybe, I'd put a question mark, a cast of question mark specimen, because I haven't been able to find out which museum has the original or which collector. Very interesting piece. So if you buy that, if I'm going to find out it's genuine, you've won the lottery. He, the lottery. he was a curator in Durban in a museum, so maybe he was lucky. Maybe he got lucky. This one has a long story. I, I, I originally owned this coin, sold it in my auction in 1975 at Glendinnings in London. And I think I got 165 quid for it. Yeah, yeah, the bloody things, uh, thousands of dollars. I don't know why I sold any coins in the past. But you know, I run out of money. People don't bring me enough money. Lovely original condition, tone. Newark with an E on the end. Mm. OBS for obsidinal. Obsidinal money, siege money. Did you realise the OBS was there? That's what it was there for? I don't remember the They cut these, these up for... Uh, uh, tin plates and things, didn't they? Uh, yeah, not tin plates, no, silver plates. Silver plates, plate. yeah. yeah. Can I buy that? Uh, at £165 every day. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm not collecting now. I've decided to let you all have my stuff. I just don't know how I'm going to live long enough to you cut all the right. <laughs> you know, I might have to deal with Mark stuff soon, you know. There's never a dull moment, you've just got to keep collecting. Another no, not. Alive. No, this is a nice Cromwell half crown and the owner said to me, I want 5,000, but I won't take less. Anyway, he's seen the online bidding, he said, you can let it go for four. Make it a muzzle. <laughs> so you, you've got to bid about 4.2 to get it. <laughs> nice Cromwell half crown. Well, these coins are all right. All these British coins, I estimate them, they're all good buy. All the foreign coins are good buying. All the estimates are very fair. The gold coins are all very fair. The Australian coins is where there's been a bit of a funny market. You know they've been higher in the past, now they're down. This is a lovely crown from Rado's, because I've always wanted this one because it's in mint condition. It's a common date, but it's a 1700 um, William III crown. Just in lovely condition. Lot uh, 2053, I put 2,400 on it. I see they want that in pounds in the ball and St James auction calendar, right? But I, same condition, 2,400 pounds. Where would you buy? In London or here? Here. <laughs> so why can't you all pitch in together and get a little syndicate going? Right. You can, but who's going to look after Call it the Australian Numismatic Society collection. Well, we might be able to get approval to buy it from with the funds we've got. Yeah, that's good thinking. <laughs> well, just to have, just to have coin. I mean, the Newcastle Numismatic Society, they come every Thursday and view, they'll be here on Thursday. Alan Charlesworth, the other, they'll buy a lot of things. And they sell them in their own little society auction. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> This is an interesting coin from Lawson's collection again. It's a James VIII, the Pretender, Stuart Pretender of the Throne of Scotland, um, Patent Crown. Uh, it's dated uh, 1688, okay? But you know when it was struck? 1828. Because Matthew Young found the dies, and he struck a few off in 1828, and then handed the dies into uh, the museum, they defaced them. I found that fascinating. That's three thousand dollars. That one, very, very rare coin. It's got his old envelope there. I'm nearly going through the coins. I try to show you things in order. We get, oh yeah, in the foreign coins. Here's a beautiful Belgian coin from that collection by Yeoman by type. I looked it up, I thought, oh, this, what's he going on about? He wants 12,000 of this coin. Anyway, I put it at 8,000, but I looked it up in, in, in Krauss, Michelin, and it's like 15,000 or something, or 12,000. So it's a lovely proof, uh, 1866, five francs. 
um, Leopold the second. But in this angle with the lighting, you can't you can't see the beauty of it. You've got to get it at the right angle. But it's a I've never had it before. A great coin. I haven't picked out a lot of the world silver coins because I don't want to end up time. Well, just to feature the fact that we've got in the 11th session at 11.30 on the Thursday, we've got this collection of Edward VIII coins and medals uh, formed by the late Ian McCutcheon of Tauranga in New Zealand. And I mean, it's so extensive. And there's a, there's a, a box lot of books that relate to it as well. And John O'Connor, I said, well, the vendor said, look, the agent for the vendor said, look, I want a proper job done. Don't rush it. And I said, I haven't got time to do it. So we did it for this sale. I got John O'Connor to tidy him up for about three weeks, drove him mad. And of course, well, the result is you've got a 30-page catalogue, beautiful illustrator, that I'm going to lose about $5,000 on. A $20,000 collection. But I thought this one was an interesting design. Remember our crown, 1937? Hey, what about that? Mm. This medal wasn't even made by an Englishman. It was made by an Austrian. What, 2907? Has anyone ever seen that before? No. No? Mm-hmm. What sort of collectors are you? What have you been doing all your lives? 2909, I've never seen it before either. So what have you been doing? Trying to get to see these things. <laughs> uh, I've seen it now, so... It's by J. Thornton Hayen for the Vienna Mint. Interesting. He was a popular boy, wasn't he? Our Bonnie Prince uh, Edward. I've been watching his series of The Crown on Edward Windsor. Netflix. I saw uh, what he was like. And, uh, you know, hmm. Interesting. And a lousy king. Yeah. <laughs> he made a lot of, they made a lot of medals. His visits, his royal visits, his coronation, which never happened, and then his abdication. Huge number. This is an Austrian 100 uh, Kronen, 1923, if you'd like to see that, a large Austrian from the Vardo collection. That's mm-hmm. estimated at $3,000. Slot number... 2968. Yeah. Kruger Rands, they're bullion coins. I sold seven today to a bloke. I said, just transfer me the money and they're yours. Um, he bought about 20 odd from me in the auction, the last auction. Uh, this is the German East Africa. 15 rupees struck in East Africa at the Tabora Mint, the tea under the date. And there are two varieties, and, and Rado's collection has both varieties. So they're two and a half thousand each. He unfortunately didn't have a German New Guinea 20 mark because I've been trying to buy one for someone, and the last one I saw was on the market. I thought oh, I had a chance of getting it. Went for 70,000 Australian. And I was trying to struggle to sell them before for 25,000. So that's a coin you should have bought from me. In fact, one guy did, and he died, and his son's got it, but his son won't sell it to me. And he's got 50000 to put on the table for it. <laughs> well, he's not even collecting. Obviously, he doesn't, he doesn't need he money He doesn't yet. need money, no. He yes. lives a simple uh, life. <laughs> he's a bachelor. <laughs> so there's some, some German gold. That this is uh, from Prussia. These are two Frederick de Yours. A double Frederick. Uh, named after the king, Frederick II. This is a trade coinage, 1750, estimate 3000. A dealer from Florida has bid on that. You get bids in on these coins early, which is good. The catalogue got there early, and some of my old hands are like me. They're dinosaurs, they send you e- emails and don't uh, go online. <laughs> some people still trust me with their bidding. Been doing it for years. When you look at the catalogue prices, then you put an estimate on, and then the, you're struggling to get the estimate. You know, about a third to a half of the catalogue value. You think, what, what, where is this market? Come to the auction.
put your hand up. You never know, you might go home with something. There's another one. This is Frederick Willem III, trade coinage, to Frederick of 1800. This looks to be in nice condition. Estimate 2000. Now, Rado was, uh, he had a lot to do with Holland, he, but I think he was Hungarian, and he had a coin which I couldn't believe. I thought, what is this? This is some sort of joke, this coin, some sort of medal. And it's actually a lot coming up, a lot, 3044. It's a little commemorative piece uh, that was struck as a gold golden in 1896 in 750 fine gold in the style of the early coins. There's only a hundred struck. It's in Friedberg at 10,000 US. I put 1,500 on it. And I bet no one's ever seen one before. So... I'm enlarged within the catalogue. And it's on the front cover. See what happens with that one. Um, this is a nice little coin from Holland. Uh, a 14 Alden. And it's good, extremely fine. A thousand dollars. So. That's worth buying, isn't it? They're pretty little coins, those 18th century Dutch coins. Now the next one I'm going to show you is 3105, is a Romanian gold coin. A hundred lay uh, commemorative of um, Carol the first, 1906 for the 40th anniversary of the reign. It's estimated 3,000 shows two portraits there. Now, I, one of them says 1866 to 1906. And I'm looking at them. Are they two different men? I better look at my catalogue and work that one out. Does anyone know? One was a young portrait and the other one was 40 years later. Yeah, but it's, this is the 40th anniversary, so it's probably 40 years on. Yeah. You know, 40 years of his reign or something. Yeah, it's probably the same man. Yeah. It says Carol first on both sides. Um, in the 12th session, is entirely devoted to Indian coins and the beginning of the selling of and the, probably the best part of the Flynn collection of Indian coins and this is just a sample of an unusual one this is a Sultan's of Malwa a square gold tanker I know you'd be interested to see a square coin issued in um, 1469 <coughs> to 1500 period and it's estimated at $600. So you won't complain about that, will you? <coughs> there are many, many great coins in Flynn's collection. But we've selected... a couple of super rare... Um, Rupees of the Mughal Emperor, and uh, one struck in um, Lahore. This one here, lot number 3250, and you can see Flynn's beautiful calligraphic handwriting. Uh, many of his coins are in bulk lots, in bags with these envelopes. You've got I mean, anybody who's... This, is, this one was 
truck. It was bought in Kabul in 1972 for the tune of one pound. Anyway, none have ever appeared on the market. They're in museums, in exactly the same form as that. There's about two or three of them. It's estimated at ten thousand dollars. We'll see what interest it creates. The rule is very, very rare. He's Dawa Baksh. Baksh. Uh, um, there's a whole story about him there, the footnote to the lot. Another great rarity is these three sets. This is one that struck a Dhaka, and this is uh, modern Dhaka. Uh, I mean, I can't pronounce these names. It's Azimush Shan, and he's a silver round rupee. When we discovered this one, uh, it was sort of confirmed by a man who's an expert collector of these things, a retired doctor who said, I can't believe it, I'm looking at this one. And uh, one was sold about 20 years ago by C&G for 15,000 US, the only one to ever come on the market. So another extremely rare ruler. Now they all look the same to us novices, but to the experts they can see the little squiggle. And that, every, every coin, even the common coins that Flint had, they have these beautiful inscriptions handwritten out on university envelopes. Now he was a fellow of the Royal Numismatic Society from 1958, spent a lot of time in Asia, in India, those parts, Persia, Persian script he was an expert on. So it's, it's, it's interesting to see them and we're very lucky to have them. Uh, so that's the Indian and then the 13th session is military. And I know you're all love. Oh no, there's some Indian I've got for you. I'm going to show you. Uh, I know you all like this one with the lion and the palm tree for the East India Company. That was one of Dr. Flynn's. Three, four, two, three. It's estimated four thousand. A lovely mohawk, nice condition. Please sit And then there's another one from another source which is estimated two and a half, not quite as nice as that. This one here is a, a coin from Rado's collection. It's the Empress Gold Mohair of 1888, estimate 2000. British India. Then we move the coins around a bit, we go back to the East India Company and we have a Madras Presidency gold mohur issued in 1817 to 1818. Dr. Flynn's collection, a very rare one, $2,000. Indian coins will come, they have gone up extraordinarily, but they will be good for a long time because they're getting, like the Chinese, they're getting more and more wealthy, certain people. I don't know, that's probably a good series to collect. A lot of collectors there now, mm. in India. Yeah. We've got the literature here if you need some information, you've just got to be able to get up a ladder. <laughs> So that's the end of the Indian. Now I'll go to, I'll just go to the ancient coins, and then I'll finish with the war medals and banknotes. So here's, here's an bank ancient. Notes miss. Hmm? Give the banknotes a miss. Well, we're running short of time, I guess. Yeah. By the time we've done all this. Yeah. I wanted to show you the Bank of Parramatta note. Oh, I can see that one. Yeah. <laughs> that's a Philip II gold stater. Estimates. Uh, Five thousand a time, four and a half. Four, five, two, three. Four and a half thousand. Uh, a Roman gold coin of the Emperor Nero Claudius Drusus, father of Germanicus and Claudius. He died in 9 BC. This 
This is a rare aureus. It's 12,500. It's from Dr. Flynn's estate. He bought it from one of our sales for 19,000 hammer. So you're in front if you buy this one for 12,500. I remember talking him into it. It was 23,000 estimate. So that's a good deal, it's 19. It's on the front cover of the catalogue as well. There's a very nice uh, Carthaginian Syracusian piece here, Tetradarm, 4588, good pedigree, uh, enlargement of it. It's uh, Seculo Punic, mint of the camp, silver Tetradarm. It comes from a numismatica arts classica option 2016. The estimate's 5,000. Realised 3,200 Swiss francs. Nice coin to get. Well, there's um, a very large octodrum. What? 4593 of the Duronis, a Thraso Macedonian tribe. Do, do, do decadrum, sorry. 12, 12 drums, is it? Yeah. And very rare. And it's got its pedigree there, going back to Freeman and Sear. And it's estimated at 8,000. Expertly catalogued by Mr. Pitchfork, I might say. All the right details. Here's a 4693, which is a... 4693, that's way down. Yeah. Good sale we've got. I'll be tired by the end of this. This is an Egyptian King Ptolemy I, after Alexander the Great. Tetradarm, estimate 2000. It comes from a newsman. Maybe got asked classic auction in 2002. Pretty good coin. And one person gave me one sole consignment, so I thought I'd show it to you of a Roman denarius. And it's of um, Sextus Pompey. Estimates 1500. There's a lot of Roman coins in this sale, and some in multiple lots, bulk lots. Uh, you know, three, four, five, six coins and a lot in silver. Tremendous bargains, tremendous value. As President Trump would say, tremendous value. <laughs> There's a Augustus Denarius. It's just a sample of the Roman Imperial one. I won't show you the war medals then, will I? Or will I? Got time for a few, I guess, Jim. This the banknotes are interesting. Um, that's the Augustus, four seventy three. Just he was the the beginning of the Roman Imperial Empire. This banknote is of the Bank of Parramatta, 1830-something. OK, it wasn't issued, but it was printed in England. But Hannibal MacArthur, MacArthur's son, or MacArthur's son or brother or something, um, his name goes up this way on the note, in script. It's hard to read. And there's only a couple of these, and that's a fabulous historic bank note. He, he had a business in Parramatta which sort of failed, I think, 1830 or something. But you read all about it in the textbooks of Lord Donald and the other ones. I don't know, what's the estimate on that? That's 4143. 4143, the estimate's 5,000. This is an Australian banking company of Sydney. I haven't had one of those in the sales before. Well, not for a long time. It was in our 
last in our sale, 33, which goes back a long way. Um, we're now up to sale 119, so it's a long time ago. Estimate 7,000. I won't go through all the bank notes because I'll, I'll stop a quarter past. Gives us time for a cuppa. Yeah. Everyone's got to get trains and trains. That's a Bank of New South Wales note issued during the banking crisis, 1893. Now, you couldn't normally collect that, except that one was cancelled. It's come out of the archive years ago. It's a great note, great rarity. Uh, that one's estimated at uh, 6,000. It's out of our sale, 31. I could show you this Bank of Queensland one from 1892 or 1893. An issued note from. Um, That's a perfume for you, isn't it, Rod? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> Almost. Instead of getting by that one. <laughs> That's um, Bank of Queensland issued Toowoomba. pound of Toowoomba. 15,000. It's in nice condition, very fine. So, a very valuable note. So there are a few good early bank notes. Now, I won't show you the other notes because I had an error note, but you've seen those before. Military groups, there's a, a group for a British soldier in World War I. 100 years since uh, armistice yesterday. Uh, military cross in two bars, so he won it three times, the military cross, in France, in Belgium. So he's got the other awards at the end in those countries. So that's a nice piece, nine and a half thousand years, but I don't know where Gerhard gets nine and a half instead of ten, or, but he does it. He does it to me, <laughs> to do <zoom> my <laughs> The guy who owns this one, it's a bravery medal for rescuing people. It's got the Royal Humane Society, but it's also got, uh, for the Tasmanian policemen, it's got a uh, George, George medal, Queen Elizabeth. You don't get those too often. Yes, well, and that's 15,000, so that's a major piece there for George Have you had enough? Yeah, I think so, Jim. Okay. Well, if, if Gladys was here, I would have shown her the nurse's dress, but she's not here. So don't worry. I'll call that quits then. <coughs> I've enjoyed talking to you all. You've been a very attentive and quiet audience. <laughs> all right, is that it? Yes. Are there any questions for Jim? We did have a few questions um, during, the, during the presentation, but um, we have more on now. Any more questions? Well, I, um, I have the certificate of appreciation for, uh, for your presentation, Jim. You. Um, but as well as that, I'd like to um, sort of express my thank you um, from a couple of... Uh, one person in particular who came to one of the point fairs that I go to, and um, he told me his story about his collection and he told me that when he came to this establishment and saw Jim Noble, he was yeah, he then felt that he was in good hands. He um, he'd actually got burnt by a couple of other dealers and um, he had to liquidate his um, collection. Uh, but then again, you know, like um, when I say collection he, he was a um, a collector for superannuation. Um, so he was a yeah, he, he, bought, he was buying for his superannuation fund. But um, when he had to liquidate his, um, his collection, uh, what was left of it, um, Jim here helped him out. So I thank you for that too. You're and um, Good job. All the best. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you.
Para, para talk. I'll get out the way. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Smile, you on the camera. camera. All right. Um, <coughs> we're running out of time, so we're just going to close the meeting then, and uh, we'll have our.